We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Right, wonderful. I think we are ready to start. We have, um, I think, all of our esteemed panelists with us today. Um, so now we can actually get the session underway. Um, thank you all for, for your patience. And um, we're really looking forward to a good conversation. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, and welcome to the Freedom Online Coalition session on internet governance in the 2020s. My name is Emma Alonzo, and I'm the director of the Free Expression Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology. I'm delighted to be your moderator today. Um, during today's session, we will hear from representatives of several of the member states of the Freedom Online Coalition, including the outgoing chair, Finland, the incoming 2022 chair, Canada, as well as representatives from Germany and from the Freedom Online Coalition's multi-stakeholder advisory network. Our goal for this session is to discuss how the FOC has developed over the years and to explore the role of government in addressing the opportunities and challenges around human rights in the digital context over the next decade. We will also discuss the future of multi-stakeholder approaches to internet governance, and we invite you to share your ideas and questions as well. Um, for those of you who are joining by the uh, via the Zoom, joining us remotely, you can use the, the chat to your right um, to add in your, your questions, your comments, or ideas during the session. And we will have a, a dedicated period toward the end of the session where we can address those. Um, and if there are any folks in the room, it's a little bit hard to see from here. Uh, I believe there are microphones and maybe um, a setup of someone in the room who will monitor and let us know if folks in the room would like to, to come in and ask questions. Um, so if if anyone in the room knows how that system is supposed to work, uh, please do let me know. Um, but I'm sure we will find a way to get um, your thoughts and, uh, and contributions in as well. Before I hand it over to our panelists, I just want to give a little bit of background about the Freedom Online Coalition for anybody who may not be um, deeply familiar with it. So the FOC is a partnership of now 34 countries who work together to promote and protect human rights online worldwide. This year is the 10th anniversary of the Freedom Online Coalition. Its members include governments from across the globe who work together to shape global norms through joint action, and in particular through developing joint statements on different topics and leveraging the language and key messages of those statements globally, both in their individual capacities and through diplomatic coordination. FOC statements aim to articulate a rights respecting vision for key issues in global internet policy and frequently include recommendations for governments, industry actors, and civil society. Recent statements reflect some of the priority issue areas for the FOC and include joint statements on the spread of disinformation online, COVID-19 and internet freedom, artificial intelligence and human rights, and digital inclusion. The FOC governments are also supported by a multi-stakeholder advisory network that includes civil society, including myself, uh, academic experts, technologists, and industry representatives who provide input to the FOC's programs of action and statements, share their specific knowledge and expertise, and who also provide proactive advice on issues that the advisory network urges the FOC to consider or to intervene in. This panel will aim to highlight a broader perspective on FOC key priorities, including disinformation, digital inclusion, and artificial intelligence, and to provide a more detailed understanding of how specific governments translate and operationalize the recommendations of the FOC joint statements into concrete actions with tangible outcomes. The panel will also address the likely developments in global internet governance in the coming years, and will discuss the importance of supporting and developing multi-stakeholder approaches to internet governance for protecting human rights in the digital environment. So to get us started, I will now th turn things over to our panelists, starting with Mr. Rauno Marasari, who is the Finnish ambassador for human rights. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Emma. and. Um... Hello, my colleagues and, and all participants of the of the Internet Governance Forum. Um, this is Helsinki, minus 16 in Celsius, I believe. And I really like to see you all, all you in person, but, but, um, but let's do it this way. Um, 
I, I'm going to say some words about the FOC's joint statement on spreading of disinformation. But before that, let me share some of uh, views of our experiences as the chair of the Freedom Online Coalition this year. So we have been honored to chair the coalition during the coalition's 10th anniversary this year. And last week, my government organized the FOC ministerial meeting, uh, 30 ministers out of 34 member states. They were mainly foreign ministers, attended the ministerial conference. Uh, in addition, Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton, one of the initiators of the coalition, gave a strong message in, in the meeting about how to regulate online content by public and private sector actors. Both have to bear their responsibilities for safe and open online environment. You can still watch the live stream of the meeting on the Finnish Ministry for Foreign Affairs website. The FOC Ministry launched the FOC 10th anniversary Helsinki Declaration which will direct the coalition's work in 2020s. The FOC governments will strive for a world that is rules-based, democratic, and inclusive. The internet must be accessible to as many people as possible globally, regardless of, of their background or gender. During the uh, chairship year, uh, I've come to notice that the FOC is more important than ever. As the pace of digitalization is overwhelming and we see a lot of negative sides to, to it as well as human rights online are being contested. Open internet is on the brink due to long-term democratic decline, regulatory and technical fragmentation, and a new era of geopolitical competition. We need to defend rules-based international order, including universal human rights online and offline, in order to keep the internet open and interoperable globally. Our response to these growing challenges is strengthening the global coalition of states and other stakeholders. Democratic states have a special responsibility in defending global free and open internet. A responsibility to respect and promote human rights and freedoms nationwide, and a leadership role in promoting international cooperation. Alliances between democratic states are needed more than ever. But it is not enough in de defending open and international internet. We need more dialogue with the states are not yet a part of the, any coalitions or which are favorable to the multi-stakeholder internet free, freedom agenda promoted by bodies such as the Freedom Online Coalition. Truly really global internet is inclusive, accessible and affordable everywhere. According to the ITU, roughly 40% of the world population is still offline. Building trust in the safe digital space is one important aspect of connecting those who are not online. And openness and transparency are cornerstones of the, of the trust. We need more global north-south cooperation to reach sustainable development goals, including equal access to internet. I'm proud of the fact that the Freedom Online Coalition members represent all continents. We can still strengthen our outreach and in increase the number of the FOC member states. We are now 34. This year we have welcomed two new members, namely Italy and Luxembourg to the coalition. The handover to the next FOC chair is coming soon and we are happy that Canada is will, will hold the chair the FOC chairship in 2022. And now some words about the about disinformation and human rights. The FOC issued uh, at the be beginning of this year a joint statement on 
on spreading of this information. And Finland was honored to lead the drafting process with the United Kingdom. Uh, this information is a growing human rights challenge at the time when people all over the world increasingly turn to the internet to connect, learn, and consume their, their news. This information can hinder open exchange of information, freedom of op opinion and expression, and right to access to information. This information can erode trust in democratic institution and public information. And it can, it can lead to polarization and increasing stigmatization and dis discrimination. And combating uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown in, in every concrete way that we need global fact-based information by cross-border communication networks and independent media. But to be frank, we Finns have also a specific interest to strengthen international cooperation in combating disinformation. Due to our history and geopolitical position, we are very well aware of cross-border disinformation campaigns. According to international rankings, we Finns have reached a high resilience against disinformation due to our historical historical experiences and by high quality education for all children. And this includes teaching media and, and digital literacy skills. But in sum, the FOC calls upon all governments to refrain from conducting and sponsoring disinformation campaigns. We urge all stakeholders to take active steps to address the issue in a manner that respects human rights law and we must combat disinformation in particular if it's the targeting of an impact on women and the most vulnerable. The, I believe that the FOC will continue in disseminating the, the joint statement in the international fora. The time of disinformation is not over, I'm afraid. Combating disinformation will be an elementary part of our work for freedom of expression and other human rights. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. Yes, and I think the um, it, it's such a great example of how simple sometimes some of the calls in the joint statements um, from the Freedom Online Coalition can be, that, but the very obvious point of needing to call on governments not to conduct disinformation campaigns as sort of that's that's the baseline that we need to be moving from, um, uh, you know, in addition to the other recommendations in the statement that go, you know, more granular, but I, I just a, a quick reflection that that is something I think is really beneficial in the statements where where you really see what does it look like to lay a human rights based foundation for this kind of work. Um, and and some of the most obvious first principles uh, need to be articulated. Um, for our, our next speaker, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Regina Greenberger, who is the cyber ambassador from the German Federal Foreign Office. Um, over to you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, let me start with congratulating the Finnish chair of the Freedom Online Coalition for keeping up the speed of the activities of the Freedom Online Coalition, also in times of COVID. And it, you had an incredible annual conference, I think, last week. And uh, we are really grateful that you are uh, dealing with complicated issues in complicated times. Um, the, the Freedom Online uh, Coalition has its 10th anniversary now, so I think it's fit for survival and, uh, and we need it. I would like to start with recalling some elements um, of our annual conference in 2018 in Berlin. The then Minister Maas, uh, just at this very moment is the inauguration of the new government. So uh, Minister Maas is outgoing and uh, Annalena Baerbock is uh, coming in. Maas said then in his speech, uh, he quoted Timothy Gordon Ash, the internet is a, a kind of global mega city, a virtual cosmopolis. The question is whether we succeed in keeping the internet as a space of freedom or will it be an instrument of oppression? Will we succeed in organizing democracy in the age of digitization or will the internet become a threat to democracy in the end? 
In 2018, we chose as a theme for the conference Internet Freedom at a Crossroads. Now, three years later, it sadly seems sometimes that somebody has chosen the wrong turn, or at least not the right turn, because Internet freedom is, is still an issue. We still haven't found uh, a way, for example, to defend the civic space. Uh, I don't have to mention the Pegasus software. But we made also some progress. For example, the Human Rights Council adopted the first consensus resolution ever on a digital rights issue, for a digital issue with a resolution on the right to privacy in digital age. For the German government, fundamental freedoms and human rights apply online as much as offline. And so do rule of law, democratic values as laid down in international human rights law. And it is more relevant than ever to underline this. So um, now for digital inc inclusion, that was the point that I should focus on. Um, Germany worked uh, in the FOC task force on, it was called digital equality, as a co-chair with our dear colleagues uh, from Ghana. Free and open access to the internet uh, for all, who would deny that this is nowadays one of the key elements of global equality. Rana has already commented on this. While especially mar marginalized groups, including girls and women, can benefit most from the internet, it is them who may face higher hurdles to access since societal divisions are reproduced online. This is, I have to mention it because I, uh, I chaired a working group also in the UNESCO, uh, in the German chapter on uh, inclusivity of the internet. It, it, is, it was clearly shown that this is also the case in a developed society like Germany that girls and women do not have the same access to internet as men. Initiatives to close digital divides and also to support bridging the gap between the global south and the global north, support digital inclusion has been a steady element of our government's efforts. But let us not forget all the groups and persons who have been denied free and full access to internet and social media on purpose by their governments. Let us think, for example, of the Chinese tennis player Peng Shui, whose messages from social media have been deleted. We know that controlling the flow of online communication is an element of policy in some authoritarian countries. And various forms of internet shutdowns affect whole populations or large parts of it time and again. I therefore welcome the launching of the Freedom Online Coalition's Task Force on Internet Shutdowns, which Germany will also be part of. This is a hard truth. All the topics that we had on the table in 2018 are as pressing now as they were then. Thank you. No, thank you. And thank you for that, that those reflections on sort of what we were all talking about three years ago, four years ago, how both some of the same issues are just as prevalent now as they they always have been, but also how they've changed. And in some cases we've made progress and in some cases the problems have have taken on a different angle or, or, or gotten more complex. Um, I'll, I'll turn now to uh, Mr. Philippe Andre Rodriguez, who's the Deputy Director for the Center for International Digital Policy with Global Affairs Canada. Thank you, Emma. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you can hear me uh, properly. Uh, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to participate uh, once again in the Internet, uh, Internet Governance Forum, and I'm doubly pleased to do so alongside esteemed colleagues uh, from fellow FOC countries uh, and the Coalition's Advisory Network, and also just wanted to uh, congratulate Finland on such a a great uh, successful um, chairship of the FOC and, and Freedom Online Conference uh, earlier. Uh, this month. Uh, disinformation, digital inclusion, artificial intelligence, uh, three topics that are really at the heart of what our team does at Global Affairs Center for International Digital Policy. And I must say, it's really three issues that we really talk about uh, all together, that we don't try to disentangle given all the, 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 the obvious links between the three. Um, and so my intervention really will focus on, a, on artificial intelligence. I will start with a few words about Canada's engagement at the FOC, 
and then drill down on our leadership of the FOC Task Force on AI and Human Rights. Um, as a founding member of the FOC back in 2011, Canada recognized the need for a global coalition of states in partnership with stakeholders in civil society and industry to fight for internet freedom and human rights online. I don't have to tell this audience that the need has only intensified over the past decade. And I also don't have to tell this audience that human rights like free expression, association, assembly, and privacy are not the only equities at stake for democracies like ours. In short, the work of the FOC is more urgent than ever before, which is why Canada is proud to be chairing the FOC in 2022, as announced by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau at the Paris Peace Forum uh, during a panel uh, on which Emma also uh, was present and continuing the great work by Finland this year. Now back to AI. We launched the Task Force on AI and Human Rights, or TFAIR, uh, in 2020. TFAIR has really come to serve as a hub for FOC engagement on all things AI. As AI is really an umbrella term that encompasses a huge range of technologies in policy circles, if not in technical circles, the corresponding risks and opportunities for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law are varied and complex. TFAIR's work is guided by the conviction that the governance of AI must be rooted in our international human rights framework. Why? Because our international human rights framework addresses some of the most pressing societal concerns about AI, including non-discrimination, privacy, and the right to effective remedy when violations occur. Because our international human rights framework establishes and clearly defines the responsibilities of governments and the private sector, both critical players in the development, use, and management of AI systems. And because our international human rights framework enjoys unparalleled global recognition that no ethical framework on AI could hope to achieve. Although ethical principles may be complementary, human rights must remain the foundation of AI governance. TFAIR brings together over 30 organizations, including 15 countries, as well as members of the coalition's multi-stakeholder advisory network. And in the spirit of multi-stakeholderism, we have developed a growing network of external consultees from around the world who collaborate with us. Recognizing that literacy in this fast-moving field is a perpetual challenge in policy circles, we've taken advantage of this rich pool of expertise to hold monthly learning calls where we dive into the intersection of AI with topics such as gender and privacy to explore human rights implications and share solutions. One, fo one focus of TFAIR's work has also been producing a joint statement on AI and human rights, as Emma mentioned, which we launched at this very forum last year. This was truly a multi-stakeholder endeavor from start to finish. The advisory network helped narrow our focus on some of the most high-risk AI technologies, such as remote biometric identification and automated content moderation. We also consulted civil society at forums such as RightsCon to better understand the concerns of diverse groups, including those experiencing, experiencing sorry, intersecting forms of discrimination. The joint statement calls out the most urgent and egregious uses of AI for authoritarian and repressive purposes, such as our arbitrary or unlawful surveillance practices and censorship. Through its 10 calls to action, the statement provides a roadmap for the international community to work towards building on important frameworks such as the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. So now that we have this joint statement endorsed by all 34 FOC members, what are we doing to translate uh, words into action? Well, TFAIR and our joint statement on AI and human rights are enabling like-minded coordination at international forums where norms are under development. For example, at UNESCO, states have negotiated an instrument that aims to form the international baseline for how states should govern the development and use of AI systems. We have leveraged TFAIR as a valuable platform for states to develop and coordinate positions and ensure international human rights uh, is the basis for the governance of AI and for civil society and industry to have their say. Our experience has shown us that oftentimes smaller civil society organizations and smaller companies who are invested in the outcomes of these processes do not have the capacity to meaningfully engage and be heard. TFAIR provides a space for civil society organizations to exchange information on how to do so effectively and allows them to share that input, their input directly with FOC countries. This is especially useful when international processes are restricted to state engagement, as we've seen uh, as a growing trend uh, in the context of COVID-19. TFAIR coordination also allows FOC member countries to solidify com common positions where possible with FOC joint statements as a, common, as a starting point in common position and strategize our interventions in these forums. 
This allows us to magnify our individual voices and create a block of countries that can more effectively push for a language supporting human rights, respecting technologies. And with that, I'll relinquish the floor and look forward to questions uh, and, and conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. And I, I have to say, as a, as a member of the, the TFAIR um, working group, I, it has been so useful to be able to have the, the learning calls and the sort of the sharing of information that that enables. Um, and I think it's really kind of shown a light on how issues of AI are happening across so many different governmental and intergovernmental processes and parts of government um, and that expertise is uh, broad and deep across a wide swath of, of civil society and industry. Um, and so to have a, a focal point to bring people together, um, I certainly personally found it very useful. Um, and it I it sounds like from from all of the other commentary from TFAIR members um, that, that they have as well. Um, so now I am very happy to uh, turn the microphone over to Adeboye uh, Adegoke, from, uh, who is the Senior Program Manager at Paradigm Initiative in uh, Nigeria. Um, over to you. Uh, thanks, thanks to you. Uh, thanks to the uh, FNC support unit for putting you know, this together. And also thanks to uh, the government of Finland for their leadership over the years. And uh, looking forward to Canada's leadership. Uh, let me just quickly come in to, you know, uh, with respect to how the advisory network, and just for, you know, as a means of introduction to say that I'm a member of the advisory network, and whether you are looking at the subject of inclusion or you're looking at artificial intelligence or, or concerns around this information online, uh, one thing that the uh, advisory network has been very consistent about is, number one, uh, the importance of, you know, more stakeholder approach to looking at these issues, uh, also, we are very, very particular about uh, compliance with international human rights standards, whether you are thinking of, uh, you know, how countries address the problem of disinformation or how uh, they adopt artificial intelligence systems or how, you know, they promote digital inclusion in, the, in their respective countries. Uh, one, one other point I would like to, to also emphasize is the importance of creating models that uh, can be replicated across different jurisdictions and countries. So what we have seen, for example, is that uh, many of the bad policies or laws that have been developed are easily copied and you know, shared across many countries. Uh, it, 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 it has been noticed that in, in a lot of instances, uh, you hardly find a proper, or what, we, what the internet governance model, model should look like in terms of having a more stakeholder approach to developing many of the policies that have been developed by, you know, regarding whether he high or, or disinformation or even a general subject of inclusion. Uh, and I think this is creating uh, a, a big problem or issues across the world, especially when you look at the global south. Uh, in Africa, for example, you have many countries, about, uh, you know, adopting cyber security laws or cyber crime laws that have very problematic provisions. And by the time you look at many of these laws, you see that they are copied from uh, one country, so one country does it first, another country starts to copy it. Uh, so I also feel that through the platform of FOC, uh, we can also encourage countries in the FOC that have committed to you know, promoting the open internet to also show some leadership by also helping to create model laws uh, that a lot of other countries can learn from or can adopt. Because uh, most times when many of these countries, especially in the global south, are trying to enact legislation or create policy to address many of these issues, they're just looking around for which country has done this before. Uh, and is there any model that we can adopt? And it is any example that they find around that they uh, you not know, try to implement within their own local context. So uh, I'll probably stop to hit there uh, to allow for you know for that question and for that engagement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Boye. Well, and I will probably, um, I might turn the microphone right back over to you because I'd like to, to start off um, some kind of discussion amongst the panelists. Um, so the framing of this, this session is looking at internet governance in the 2020s. And I would love to hear reflections from panelists on across these different issues we've been talking about, um, digital inclusion, artificial intelligence, disinformation. What do you see, especially coming up in the next year or two as kind of key issues or or challenges that we're facing in the internet governed space whether that's a particular law in a particular country or a process that you have your eye on in one of these topics and what would you like to see the the foc be able to do um, with that so so maybe I'll, I'll pass that first to, to boye but then um would love to have everyone else come in on that as well all right thank you uh, so i'm happy to take the floor 
Uh, so, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, I always speak from, from number one, civil society bias, then global south bias. And when I look at it from that perspective, uh, I see uh, a lot of challenges in terms of uh, the, you know, the, the, the internet governance models that uh, countries in the global south seems to be adopting. Uh, and I kind of, you know, have some basic understanding of why this is so. Uh, I think there, there is a lot of struggles with, you know, having a grasp of, you know, uh, understanding the, inter uh, the internet and, you know, coming up with, or having a grasp of how, how to really, to, to really create uh, internet governance system. Uh, so irrespective of what is happening in the, perhaps in the most developed countries, whether efforts by the US government, you know, through its internet freedom project and its proposed, uh, uh, democracy forum that uh, I think uh, that is happening in, in a few days from now. Uh, I think that my biggest concern is what is happening uh, in, in many global South countries and, and you know and in Africa especially. What we have seen rather is more of restrictions, more of you know efforts by uh, local governments to uh, to to have kind of have a hand on on governance of the internet. You know, approaching the same traditional model that. Uh, that traditional government has taken over the years. So what we have seen is that there is very, very, uh, there is this, uh, there is this lack of interest in in approaching it with a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, there is a tendency to want to I think we're having a little bit of trouble with your audio. Internet is government, our decisions about content takedowns, etc. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. Just as I was saying that we were having a hard time hearing you, the the audio cleared back up, so we can hear you now. Concerns that we see with regards to approach, uh, it really has uh, all stems from the lack of a base to approach uh, internet governance. Uh, and, and I think because of that frustration, government are just coming with whatever they understand, whatever they think uh, in their own, based on their own, you know, understand whatever they think works for them uh, and that's a disadvantage for 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 the for the global south for africa and a lot of countries whereby uh inclusion is still a big subject so you are trying to encourage more and more people you have government coming up with restrictive laws restrictive policies introducing social media taxes when you are talking about uganda uh, that has using social that has introduced social media tax so you are looking at nigeria that has suspended twitter for a while now you know there are a lot of those policies that are coming up and, and these are happening side by side with concerns around inclusion. A lot of people are still not online. We are trying to, you know, push for more people to get online. Whereas there are these policies that are coming up that are that you know practically would discourage a lot of people from coming online. And lastly, let me also mention that I think one of the challenges that we have also seen is the cyber security gaps that exist uh, in many countries, uh, especially from the global south perspective. Uh, and because of this. Uh, there are also concerns regarding interest in, in engaging or fully participating online by a lot of people who, are, who can potentially be a victim of online cyberbullying, for example, gender violence, etc., and all of that, because there is no system in place. People don't feel protected enough. A lot of people don't feel protected enough. So we are seeing a lot of self-censorship. Uh, and I think within that context, there is a lot of expectation regarding the role of government and the private sector uh, in ensuring that people feel really safe online, in order to encourage more and more people to get online. Uh, almost half of Africa, for example, are still offline. And we want to get as many as possible for, you know, of those people to come online. And there is always that need to remove the barriers. So apart from the policies that the governments are coming, you know, coming, coming up with, we also need to look at uh, issues and challenges around safety online, which I think is deterring a lot of people from, you know, wanting to, to come online and participate in the digital world. Thank you. No, thank you. That was, um, I think, really powerful. And 
makes me think of what um, I think it was Rauno was saying kind of earlier about the, the real need and desire within the FOC to focus on more conversations and exchanges with governments who are not necessarily members of the FOC and how to kind of take that vision of a rights respecting internet and policies rooted in human rights and rule of law and and make sure that other governments are, are seeing that model and thinking of that model um, and and sharing that. Um, I'd like to invite any of our other uh, panelists to, to come in on this question of, of things that you're looking forward to um, or, or looking to trends or, or processes or issues um, coming up in 2022 and, and beyond. Um, and would also like to remind all of our participants um, that we will will shortly be turning to audience questions. So um, for folks in the room, I'm still not entirely sure how we're facilitating that, um, but if you, uh, we may just ask you to, to come off mic um, and share your question if you have them. And for folks who are are, uh, joining us virtually, um, please do add your questions in the chat. Um, but yes, would, would anyone else like to come in on this sort of looking forward question? I'm, I'm happy to, to start. Yeah, um, I can I can highlight two. Uh, one, I think we're at a crossroads between not to uh, use uh, Germany's uh, name of uh, its, its own FO conference, but we're going from a world where we were thinking about principles and we were thinking about, you know, soft law and self-regulatory processes around uh, the regulation of internet uh, companies to a world where uh, increasingly policymakers are under pressure to regulate, um, you know, the internet writ large and specific swaths of the internet in particular. Um, and because of that pressure to do to do so relatively quickly, uh, both within FOC countries, I must say, and outside, so really globally, there is a risk really that some of these regulations uh, fall short when it comes to protecting and upholding human rights. Um, and I think that's that's a real risk. Um, and Adeboye mentioned the, the importance of, of multi-stakeholder processes in this in this context. And I think there is this, a risk here because multi-stakeholderism takes time. It takes rest, resources and time to do it properly. And if policymakers are under a lot of pressure to deliver very quickly on some of these uh, issues, because that's a, a main concern that, that, that comes out of um, you know, the general population, uh, there is a risk that there's a bit of a gap there between what uh, what uh, multi what policymakers put forth and what multi-stakeholderism could bring to the table in terms of better understanding of these of these issues. So, I think that's that's a general source of concern, and we're not uh, we're not immune from from that in Canada. I think that's that's uh, that's also something we we are working on how to how to find that balance between multi-stakeholder governance and being somewhat effective uh, and responsive to these uh, to these issues. So, so that's one, and then two. More broadly, um, there is increasingly uh, what we could call a race to connectivity. Uh, and by that, I mean really a race to fund infrastructure internationally by different types of uh, regimes. Um, and in that context, there is a risk, a real risk that by over-focusing on connectivity and not thinking about the kind of enabling environment online that we are creating, we may actually drive more exclusion and more polarization, not more inclusion and not more um, uh, cohesion within societies. And so there is this piece as well where um, when we talk about connectivity, and it's something that we're, we're addressing uh, through, through the Digital Equality Task Force at the FOC, how do we create these enabling environments? How do we create uh, ecosystems where connectivity drives inclusion instead of driving exclusion as we've seen in, in some contexts internationally? So two main concerns uh, from our end. Oh, Regina, yes. Yeah, let me also uh, comment on, on opportunities and challenges. Um, first, uh, I mean, basically, um, the, the most important items were already uh, mentioned, but I would like to, uh, to say for Germany, um, we will also uh, focus on AI in, in, in the future and also within the Freedom of Online, uh, Freedom Online Coalition. I mean, AI facilitates our daily life. We use it uh, everywhere and we will increase, uh, we will increasingly use it uh, let's say on a private level, on a user level, because it makes things 
many things much easier. But on the other, on other hand, we have also facial recognition, we have mass surveillance. These are also um, uh, dangerous uh, developments um, supported by AI tools. And uh, so I think that this is really also an issue for, for the Freedom Online Coalition. We are taking over from Canada as a chair of the task force uh, next year, and I'm looking forward to, to working on this issue. Then multi-stakeholderism, that's also, that was also mentioned. Those of us who have grown up with the internet as it is, for those, this multi-stakeholderism is obvious and evident that we can't do without it because, I mean, the internet, 90% of it is private. The networks are private. They, um, and states cannot provide for, uh, for security uh, or for content themselves. So um, they have to work together with other stakeholders. But nevertheless, the, the, this, this approach of multi-stakeholder responsibility in the internet architecture is under pressure at the moment. There are states who do not um, see this as an efficient way to, uh, to govern the internet and who have other uh, ideas of state control, of authoritarian uh, control uh, on the internet, which can really change our way of how to use it. I must say that the stakeholder approach is also under pressure from another direction. And that, that is the, let's say, decreasing availability of big tech of the industry, of the private industry for our dialogues. I mean, we look around in uh, Katowice, how present are they uh, in, in our talks? I mean, uh, uh, representatives of, of, of the tech industry. This is really something we must keep them interested in these issues and have a dialogue with them in order to really be effective in um, finding the necessary rough consensus, as we call it in the Internet Governance Forum, uh, for, uh, for these uh, governance questions. And one last issue uh, that we have experienced uh, just these last days is uh, the issue of fragmentation of the Internet. Um, repeatedly, I heard from, uh, from counterparts that the Internet can be either uh, free and open or global. It can't be both. And I would like to defend this original version of the internet being free, open, interoperable, and global and secure at the same time. So um, uh, there were, for example, uh, also uh, plans from our American uh, partners and friends uh, to have a future of the internet alliance, uh, where we have to discuss, um, you know, who, the internet is us all of us. So it can't be divided in allies and others, enemies, adversaries. Uh, we have to find a solution that uh, includes um, as many uh, people as possible. And this is also an issue for digital inclusion. So I leave it with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I, I think, Rana, would you like to, to come in on that? Yeah, thank you, Emma, and thank you, uh, Philip and, and, and Regine, for your comments. So I, I fully agree, Regine, with you, what you said, that the, we must defend the globally working and open internet. I understand the challenge here because the, the uh, open in internet is, is now contested more than before. But the, the question is whether the internet is really open and free if it's not global. Uh, you said that, that the for Mr. Moss, he some way formulated this elegantly that it's a megapolis or something like that. Internet is a megapolis. I've some that said that it's like a society. So it must work that way that where all all the all, all people, business, civil society and the authorities are working together for all so that's the only way to 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 go forward um and then uh, another thing is that uh, as as philip said uh, philip said most likely 
we will have a long-term discussion about regulation, both legally binding norms and, and, and non-binding norms. And I, I see here also the specific role of the Freedom Online Coalition. We are the coalition between the states, which are our parties of different international treaties and conventions, and, and that some way gives us a, a, a many possibilities. And then my last point is about the about the uh, how to say the glue of the of, of the uh, action of the coalition. So we study some way as a classical coalition for open internet and supporting the human rights defenders online, etc. Now over the over the, over the ten last years, the the scope of the themes has been uh, widened. We are uh, discussing more um, technical solutions. A good, good example is the artificial intelligence work. Uh, the work and done by by the Canadian, our Canadian colleagues. But I believe that we some way we must come back to that point where we finally are defending and supporting the internet users, people, persons in the internet, and to be a, a, that way a, a, a clearly a human rights coalition. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I do want to check, are there any uh, participants in the, in the room in Poland who would like to ask any questions? I think you have microphones in front of you, if you do. Um, and so please feel free to come off mic right now uh, to ask your question. Oh, it looks like someone's asking a question, but we can't actually hear. Okay, I see myself. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, I think uh, because the internet, obviously, it's not governed or ruled by anyone or anything, and the internet has no borders as we know it in our physical world. Um, but to guarantee a free, open and global internet, um, it could be useful to have a, a set of rules or worldwide laws that guarantee this freedom uh, and security. But then how would we get there? Uh, that would be just an open question um, in order to secure human rights on the internet as well. That was my question. Great, thank you. Would, would any of our panelists like to, um, to offer thoughts on that? Sort of, it sounds to me like a, a kind of a question at the core of what the, the FOC is um, designed to do as far as kind of developing and establishing norms that persist across um, across nations. You know, I think uh, the the likelihood of getting kind of a single a single treaty that governs all all of the uh, different questions and challenges um, that arise in thinking about internet governance seems probably unlikely and maybe inadvisable uh, depending on, on who you talk to. Um, but I, I can just share from my perspective, I think the uh, part of what the FOC is trying to do through the process of things like developing joint statements and and the diplomatic coordination that member governments do before they participate in different fora around the world is to really um, kind of do some of that norm development and make sure that even if it's not all exactly the same law covering every, um, you know, the the internet entire, that at least as nations are building their laws and their systems or negotiating treaties on particular issues like cybersecurity or um, agreements on privacy or things like that, that there really is um, consistency and and coherency and this this fidelity and commitment to to the human rights framework as the the underlying basis. Um, I see we also have uh, a question for maybe I think it's a comment in our chat that I'll, I'll read just in case the folks in the room can't see. Um, uh, someone noting that uh, guarantee of openness is a duty not only of society, but also about governments from, um, but also about governments, uh, including connectivity and uh, participants in the internet not limiting access to service and product. So I think really underscoring kind of uh, themes that we've heard a lot on this panel about how 
crucial this issue of connectivity really is um, to to enabling um, participation online and but especially as I think Philippe was mentioning how how important it is to understand that connectivity on its own um, neither solves uh, nor nor necessarily creates problems um, but it's it's how we go about enabling connectivity and all of the um, the support and information and opportunities that people need along with access to the internet so that they can really kind of make their best use of it um, and find it as an empowering uh, function that that really drives towards inclusivity um, I think we are we are running fairly short on time so if there are no other questions, in the room or in the chat? Um, uh, yes. Oh, we do have one more in the room. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Xian Hong representing UNESCO. Uh, sorry for being late because uh, UNESCO has been supporting and part of uh, FOC uh, since a uh, long time ago. Uh, congratulations for having such a useful session. Um, I'd like to first react to the question for, yeah, uh, raised by, by the colleague sitting uh, uh, in front of me about how we promote uh, human rights at um, online. Uh, I'd like to share our work because, you know, we have the international standard of human rights in place for a long time. All the rights should be uh, promoted online, offline, and well-recognized, but uh, the implementations of the issue, political, particularly at the national level, that's why uh, we perceive the lack of evidence-based approach to, to, to improve as a practice and uh, and uh, policies at the national level. That's why we are uh, advocating to all the member states and stakeholders to do the, to do the assessment and using UNESCO's internet indicators to see to what extent those human rights are being um, protected or being violated at the national level to look at uh, the existence of the necessary legal regulatory framework whether they protect the human rights like uh, free expression, um, privacy, uh, right of uh, association online, and uh, also to uh, to give the recommendations, what are the gaps, what should be improved. And the one uh, common sharing, uh, sharing a challenge we have pursued, now we have applied uh, the indicator assessment in 34 countries across five continents, including many of the FOC countries. Uh, one strong call is really to uh, to have uh, the internet as a recognized as a human right uh, to be legalized uh, um, as, because internet is a public good and all the rights. Uh, internet means the right to everything, right to education, right to uh, participation, right to health, everything. So that's a very crucial challenge. I also uh, count on our FOC coalition to advance this agenda at uh, the national level as well. And uh, um, that's my, uh, my two cents. But also I have a question to you. Uh, FOC because at this IGF we have heard a lot of discussion on the United Nations um, um, uh, action to have a global uh, digital compact through the digital collaboration. Uh, that would be a momentum I see we can drive global changes including advancing the human rights open internet agenda. So what's your action and the strategy of IFOC in facing this new uh, uh, new initiative from, from UN uh, as an intergovernmental uh, uh, coalition with very, it's a very unique uh, uh, unique network in the IG uh, ecosystem and how uh, you would uh, suppose uh, UNESCO and the other stakeholders to collaborate with you to join synergies uh, supporting this uh, uh, global digital compact. Thank you. Yes, I see. Uh, Rauno and then Philippe. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Emma, and thank you for for the participants from, from Katowice. Um, let me first say that the we are very thankful to the UNESCO. You have been a very good and close partner to the Freedom Online Coalition. We have a diplomatic network in Paris. My Philip can maybe tell more about the future of that that diplomatic network. And we we certainly shall do more and work together and using your assessment tools. That's that's something we 
where we can still improve our our <coughs> performance. Um, and then uh, about the UN, so that has been one of the guidelines of the Finnish chairship, and I believe that also our Canadian colleagues will will continue the work to to work closely with the different UN UN bodies and UN UN um, um, initiatives. Thank you, Emma. Um, in, in one minute, very, very quickly, um, one, the FOC has already facilitated a lot of um, uh, consultations across the roadmap for digital cooperation, uh, including and especially on, on issues related to artificial intelligence through TFAIR last year. So we are already part of that process as an organization. And Canada actually co-champions alongside Mexico and other FOC member, um, the Roundtable on Digital Inclusion, at uh, that in that process uh, leading to an, a UN digital compact. So really the, the, I don't like that word, but the synergies between what the FOC does and what uh, the UN uh, Secretary General's office does, we're working quite closely. We're talking quite often uh, about these issues. So uh, really uh, we, we're looking forward to working together in 2022 and 2023 on these issues, including um, through, through Canada's chairship. And uh, also, uh, obviously, Finland has played a, a really important role, I, I should say, in facilitating and really giving a voice in Paris uh, to, to, uh, to the FOC in processes related to UNESCO. So we're, we're definitely looking forward to continuing that, that uh, conversation in Paris and beyond. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you both and, and thank you for the, the great question. Um, unfortunately, that is, I think, all the time that we have for, for questions today and we've already lost one of our pa panelists. So thank you in absentia to um, Dr. Regina uh, Greenberger. Um, I did want to give uh, Adeboye just what kind of one last opportunity for, for a kind of a closing thought um, as we've just heard from, from other panelists. So uh, Boye, if you're able, if you'd like to give kind of any last kind of conclusions, reflections, or what you'd really like to see the FOC do um, in 2022. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll leave my camera also in order to you know, uh, include, uh, include the quality of my audio. Uh, so just, you know, as the closing remark for me, uh, it would be great to see the FOC, number one, continue uh, the work that it currently does, uh, and most especially its collaboration with the advisory network. I think the advisory network has provided uh, a huge support in, in ensuring that the FOC is able to do its work. And I think that should be sustained, even as we have, you know, Canada take over the leadership of the FOC, it's very important that that is sustained. Uh, I also like to love to see more leadership for the part of the FOC, uh, in terms of uh, trying to provide guidance, you know, in addition to some of the statements that have been put out, uh, I think more can be done in terms of like so in addition to the statement, perhaps uh, more uh, more specific work uh, can be taken on in terms of providing leadership for for many other countries who are currently not members of the FOC, but who can benefit from the expertise that the FOC have access to right now. Because through the FOC, there's a lot of access to civil society expertise and private sector expertise as well. Uh, and I think a lot of other countries can benefit from that, from that even while they are not a member of the FOC. And lastly, uh, I also think that there should be a lot of work in terms of expanding the membership. There are a lot of uh, countries that need to get on board. And, and I think the FOC should work more with the AH uh, to see how a lot of countries that are represented on the AH can also be brought on board to the FOC. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And Boye, thank you for all of your work on the FOC Advisory Network. Um, a big thank, to, thank you to the government of Finland for the wonderful chairship over this past year. And uh, a thank you and good luck to the government of Canada for um, taking all of this work going forward in 2022. Um, most of all, thank you to all the participants who joined us for the panel today, um, and especially to our, our virtual participants and to, to everyone who's in the room in Poland. Um, I hope you're having a wonderful time seeing each other in person, and hopefully at next year's IGF, wherever that may be, uh, we can all be back together in person again. So thank you all.